Thank you. Yeah, I was outside uh, and, and Bill and a few people turned up for uh, Santa. I wasn't sure whether to think I was old or young. Was, uh, I started with Bill and Santa and I mean, Joe was in the in their way at the time as well, but 32 years ago, so I was uh, not quite sure whether I'm old or, or if I'm still feeling young, Bill. Uh, today, look, some of the slides in this presentation were presented in, in the Complex Ores Conference uh, in, uh, in the Ottawa Berlin Conference. But I also added some slides about commercialisation and some of the sort of challenges around around the commercialisation process. And I've, I've add, added some slides a little bit on the mineralogy and I'll talk a little bit about some of the work that I know uh, the JK MRC and JK Tech have been doing on, uh, on anti-guide arsenic mineral separation. As Joe and a number of other people in the room will know, like technology commercialisation is not easy and it's not quick. I sort of reflected the last uh, week on on that statement and I sort of thought well you pro probably can break it up into two two areas. Equipment commercialisation is probably a little bit easier. Um, things like the Jamison cell and the ISA mill that I was also involved in uh, in the early stages. Those, those pieces of equipment have lower sort of capital requirements and, and the process to get to commercialisation is a little bit easier. I don't say it's easy, um, but, but when, you, when you have a process like the Albion process or the Tuong process, I think that, that process of commercialisation is just so much more difficult and uh, there's more capital involved and the time frames are much longer. But the one thing, the one thing that I think as an industry we, we struggle to, to um, sell uh, really well is, is sometimes the, the actual benefit of the, the technology or the equipment or the process that we're, we're licensing it has a benefit and you can quantify the benefit of that process. But what we tend not to talk about or capture with the industry is, is the value that actually allows the rest of the business to unlock. Um, so I, th I think if you, if you look at the, um, the tech industry, I remember reading about 10 years ago, IBM was li licensing in about $6 billion US of IP from small IT companies and they were licensing out about $7 billion of of, uh, of uh, IT sort of technology. So the tech industry is certainly very familiar with sub-licensing and licensing bits in the plug and play, um, but the mining industry is very, very sort of slow to uh, to sort of embrace a paying for the benefits that the technology brings and paying a fair price for it, and uh, and b sort of plugging and playing a bit more. Joe and a number of other people presented some stuff on technology commercialisation at a few conferences and they talked about the value of death um, where you're trying to go from a, from a technology to commercialisation. I think Joe, there's more than one value of death, there's many values of death. <laughs> and uh, at, at each stage, you know, you've got, to, you've got to find funding to get to the next stage. And, uh, and with some of the process technologies, you know, those funding requirements are, are quite large. Um, you know, pilot plants and demonstration scale plants are very expensive. Um, so, you know, there may be two, there may be three, there may be many values of death that you would actually get through. Um, and what are, the, what are the sort of key strengths that you need to get through those? You clearly need good technical people. You clearly need good commercial people. Um, and that covers a range of skills from being able to access funding from governments or private sector. Um, yeah, so there's a range of skills that you need to be able to basically take a technology through. Uh, otherwise, you will stall. You will stall in, in the process. And, and you know, some of the things with the Tuong process, when we first set up the the partnership with Extrada uh, Copper, which David was involved in uh, when he was with Extrada Copper, we set up an agreement where we collaboratively funded some of the early intellectual property development. And one of the key things I sort of got in that agreement was if the extrava or the future owner of the technology didn't didn't um, sort of continue their interest to commercialise the technology, it would revert 100% back to core. Um, because I've seen in my time where where technologies are partially owned by people or companies and, and one loses incentive or commitment and the technology just withers and dies and it basically takes all the effort and commitment that everyone's put in and, 
and you lose that. Um, so that, that was a useful um, strategy in making sure that we could advance the technology. Having said that, Glencore sat on it for about 18 months while they were deciding what they wanted to do with the technology before they sort of handed the rights back to court. So you know, there's still challenges there that leave a long time for us. Tuong started in 2009-10, um, so we've been going 10 years and like you know, process technologies just take a long time. So I'll talk now about the, the sort of industry that the technology is trying to, the problem in the industry that technology is trying to address. Um, you're probably all aware of arsenic being an issue in, in the copper industry. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a lesser ish issue in the zinc industry and some of the other industries. Um, but it's a significant issue and we can't just keep exporting uh, high arsenic concentrates around the world to third, third world countries to process. I'll go through a bit of the, history, bit of the background, talk about some of the current solutions the industry is uh, using to sort of try and solve the problem. Talk a little bit about the, the chemistry. We won't talk much about the technology, just to give you a bit of an idea of what the flow sheet looks like. Talk about the engineering partner we brought on board to basically try and provide clients with an engineered solution. Uh, talk a little bit about how the comment I made earlier about how how you need to sell the benefit to the industry, not just the technology, um, which they just see as an extra process, an extra cost, but how it allows them to unlock their business. And, and talk about where course at and where we're, where we're going next. Arsenic in concentrates, trending up. Um, there's probably a little bit of a, a, a lull at the moment since Toromocho's production, uh, high arsenic production is dropping off. But then as the Cadell go underground operation kicks in, we're going to see another big kick up in uh, the average arsenic grade of concentrates around the world. So it's an issue that's not getting any any work any simpler, um, and obviously environmental regulations globally are, are getting tougher, and uh, so the problem is definitely continuing. So what are, what's the industry doing at the moment? We're just trying to blend the problem away. You know, dilution's the solution to the dilution of the problem. So traders and miners are basically trying to buy clean concentrates and, and blend that problem away. It works. Uh, they're paying penalties. Uh, as, as a technology developer, we thought those penalties might have got a little, little bit higher um, in the last five years than they really have. Um, but with all the competition of new smelters in China, India and, and other places, um, obviously when there's an excess of smelters, they're hungry for concentrates so they don't have the negotiating power to, to really drive the treatment charges or penalties up. So that's typically where the where the penalties sit. Uh, Antimony is a problem as well. Uh, it's less less prevalent, but it's uh, we'll, we'll talk about some of the products we we'll, we'll looked at. Obviously, there's some progress in roasting. It's an, obviously an old technology, but it works and it's been used for many years, uh, more so in uh, the Philippines and, and Chile. Um, it has some positives, obviously it removes the arsenic at, at, the, at the source near the mine. The negatives is, is you, you produce some sulfur dioxide, so the concentrates now deficient in sulfur, it's dusty and dry, so some of the customers in Asia don't like, don't like those products. Um, it's also you know, a complex process and environmentally you know, difficult to capture uh, future emissions. Then you've got other processes of whole, whole of concentrates that are leaching, uh, covering off on things like alloy process, pressure oxidation, bacterial oxidation. Um, but now you've got a massive, you've you basically got a massive downstream copper uh, refinery, uh, you know, solving extraction electro winning capital cost. And while treatment charges are low, that investment's actually not very attractive. And then there's obviously a fair bit of work being done by the JKMRC and, and other people about selective flotation. Um, we certainly support that work because in, in solving this problem, whether it's roasting or leaching or a port one process, treating a smaller, you know, higher grade arsenic product that's dirt, you know, that's um, a lower volume will be more cap capital efficient for all the processes downstream. Um, so any progress that happens in, in this area of flotation uh, separation 
uh, will be positive for, for all the solutions uh, that might be deployed. So where's the technology at? Um, we ran a large scale pilot plant in 2012. Uh, and then as I said, the technology got a little bit stranded while the Court took over Extrata and, and the Pan Packing project wasn't advanced. Uh, in 2015, the technology was sort of handed back to Core. We then basically went out to seek additional funding. Uh, we would have funded the technology internally on our balance sheet, but 2015, 16 wasn't a very friendly time in the industry to, uh, to make money out of our underlying business. Uh, so we were lucky enough to get a, a, uh, a federal government uh, grant, uh, accelerated commercialization grant to help fund the next stage. Just some of the minerals that, that the technology can leach. Um, Enagite, tenantite tetrahedrite series minerals, so the arsenic and antimony end members of, of the tenantite tetrahedrite series. Uh, Enagite, we've done work on uh, phalangerites and, and some of the other lead, copper, uh, antimony minerals. It doesn't touch the sulfides that you don't want it to touch. So it doesn't touch geoglypyrite, it doesn't touch um, arsenic pyrite, it doesn't touch scalarite. So it, it basically selectively leaches arsenic, it selectively leaches antimony. Uh, for some minerals that have mercury in the right um, sort of valence state and the right bonding arrangement, it will leach mercury. One of the things that came out of this, this sort of work is it made me sort of question what we, we look at minerals, you know, you pick a piece of pyrite or, or a piece of silica and we visualise it as a solid. And, and this sort of chemistry and this leaching and hydromet makes you go back and think, well, they're just atoms spinning around with forces holding, holding them together. They look like they're solid to us because that's what we visualise. You know, imagine a glass silica SiO2 glass and you can put an atomic needle and you can just push it through and you know, poke it through and it just goes through. So what, what's happening in the leaching system is the arsenic atom is bonded to sulfur atoms and, and our caustic based system has sulfide ions in here. For some reason, the sulfide ions in, in, the chemi in the solution have a greater affinity for the arsenic atom or the antimony atom bond. So basically, it's bonded to two atoms in the mineral atoms and it says, well, I don't, you know, I'm happy to let go of these bonds and jump onto that bond in, in the solution. So it's sort of from a mineralogical and lat mineral lattice point of view, we can actually understand what's happening to, to different minerals. Um, minerals like arsenopyrite, where, where the arsenic is bonded to a metal ion and a sulfur atom, doesn't let go of that arsenic atom. So, uh, and the other thing that's interesting, like our anodite leaches really strongly, tenotite tetrahedrite leach, leach a little bit slower. Uh, is if you look at the lattice of enagite, all the arsenic atoms are on a single plane in the mineral. And so when one pops off the surface to go into solution to bond onto a sulfur atom, it's probably likely that the next one in the lattice is just popping along. Um, because the leaching works at 70 microns, at least it works at 15 microns. So there's some, you know, we, we imagine these solids, we have to destroy them and break them down, but they're, uh, they're actually quite uh, full, of, full of space and just bonds. It works on antimony systems. The only difference between arsenic leaching and antimony leaching, so there was a large body of knowledge around antimony leaching back in the you know, 30, 40 years ago, Corby Anderson, the equity silver plant, and a number of plants. The antimony leaching needs a lot more sulfide to complex in, in the leach solution. The arsenic needs more oxygen. So that's why in, in discovering um, the, the sort of chemistry of the process, it was really about understanding that arsenic is different to, to, to antimony and it needs a higher oxygenated environment, not, not as in oxidative, but the hydroxyl ions. Um, and we've done work on, there's one project in WA which had a lot of philanderite and jamisonite. Um, it was a lead antimony concentrate and we could leach the antimony out nicely and basically the remaining concentrate was then a lead concentrate. As I said, arsenic pyrite doesn't leach and it doesn't touch chocolate pyrite, scalarite, galena. Um, 
It obviously does leach some silicates because we're running a caustic environment. Anything like the Bayer process, you know, you're going to have some alumina and some silicates that'll solidify. Just a few examples just to highlight the uh, some of these concentrates we treated. You know, two to four percent arsenic, up to sort of 08 percent antimony, coming out very low levels. Um, typically less than 0.2 and, and often less than 0.1% arsenic. So, um, and that's our aim. Like from a process point of view, we want to we remove almost all the arsenic and antimony so that we can treat the smallest amount of concentrate to actually um, you know, reduce the cost of the process. One of the other things in the chemistry is the kinetics of the leaching when you've got high arsenic, these high arsenic concentrates or high antimony concentrates, the kinetics is very fast in the leaching stage. So it's a high density leach, it's a fast kinetic, so you're not having large resonance storage in, in the leach. Um, for a low for a low grade arsenic concentrate, like the Tampak and Pilot plant, where we're dealing with one percent arsenic, the kinetic curve is more more like this. And to get down to sort of 0.5, you need more like 20 hours. Point, point, point one, you need about 20 hours. Quick run through of the process. There's a leaching stage where, where the sort of dirty concentrate comes in. We add fresh sodium hydroxide. There's a solid liquid separation stage. This primary leach recycle is actually the, the, a very important part of the process because when you leach arsenic out of the lattice in the mineral here, it basically liberates some sulfide ions. So there are some sulfur atoms that are popping off, off the surface of the <coughs> mineral as a sulfide ion. And it's that sulfide ion that helps sort of drive the, the kinetics and the, it's a bit like a fly there. So this primary to the liquor, like thick and overflow, coming back in the leach is a very important part of bringing back some sulfides so that we're not adding sulf sodium sulfide in, in the front end of the process. Clean concentrate comes out here. Basically, dirty concentrate, clean concentrate. Anyone that's been involved in hydrometric processes will always get a little bit nervous that when you leach something, the residue coming out of the leach circuit is, is difficult to filter and horrible, um, which is generally true. Um, in this process, because we're only selectively leaching a very small fraction out of the concentrate, um, and the caustic basically re-precipitates a bit of uh, aluminium and silica that leaches and almost makes like a conglomerate. The residue filtration is, is usually better than the feed, um, and it's certainly no worse. So that, as I say, from a hydrometric process, that's a bit unusual, but, but we understand why that's happening. And obviously, you know, it's not, it doesn't catch fire after with some other hydrometric residues where you've disturbed the lattice of the concentrate. Uh, you end up with a, a concentrate that might go on a boat and catch fire, and so, you know, that's a, a negative clear. Next stage, so you've got your clean concentrate out here, you take your solution out here, which is a pea soup full of every known sulfur species you can imagine, you know, polysulfides, trisulfate, tri, you know, S, X, Y, O, zero, uh, O, Y, there's everything in there. It's, it's horrible. And that's partly why most of the processes have failed. Uh, some of them at 40 degrees will turn into gels. Um, they're just, it's a horrible solution. So what do we do? We basically oxidise everything, all the sulphur species to sulphate. So then we've got it in a stable form, sulphate, and uh, and we can deal with that sulphate. A little bit of gold sometimes leaches in here, but because we run a very low sulphide regime, we don't get a lot of gold solubilisation. Uh, if gold does solubilise, it'll pop out here. As soon as you break down the sulphides, uh, whether it's salt SP minus or HS minus. Um, or some of the fire sulfates, that gold will drop out. So gold comes out here, a, a fine, fine sludge, um, and if there's a lot of antimony, you, you'll basically produce a sodium pyroantimony. So there's options there to deal with the gold, either blend it back in with the concentrate or, or treat it separately. But, um, but it's not lost. Next stage, so that's a bit of the sodium pyroantimony that's used as a fining agent in glass. So the solar cell industry is actually in demand for pyroantimony. It's gone, gone up quite a bit in the last uh, five years. 
and it basically makes the glass clearer. So the market is using a lot more sodium chloride than that. Next stage, so now you've got all the, you've, you've got basically what's left in this solution here is there's, there's a little bit of uh, silica in solution still, a little bit of, um, obviously the arsenic still in solution. You've got sulfate there as, as your sulfur species. And we're basically now doing a crystallization, cooling crystallization stage where we pull out the sodium sulfate and the, and the sodium arsenate. It's basically a two stage process. The remaining caustic that's left in this stream basically just gets evaporated from a water balance point of view and, and recycled. So the caustic consumption here is quite low. Um, we're typically only using about 11 kilograms per tonne of concentrate because most of the caustic comes back, comes back in, the, in the secondary recycling. Arsenic stabilisation. There's a whole range of different back ends that you can do. You can make ferric arsenate. You can make a vitrified um, glass I'll talk about. Um, you can make a calcium arsenate you can, and then blend that with a paste bill or it really depends on the environmental requirements and how stable you want that product. <laughs> Probably one of the other key things when we started this process, early on we looked at making ferric arsenate and, and for a project like Camp Packing we were talking about half a million tonnes a year of, of sludge, low grade, you know, one to two percent arsenic. Uh, Girthite gypsum slop, and and you know the, the land that we needed to store that, the line facility, the rehab ultimate cost, the fact that it's a, a very um, unfavourable uh, residue to, to rehabilitate, started to push us to look at look at some of these other things like you know what the nuclear industry was doing with some of their uh, uh, sin rocks and things that the CSIRO were doing. So the products we make out of the, out of the there's a sodium arsenate that goes to arsenic fixation and a sodium sulfate which is a, basically a, a detergent. Um, one of the things, this product here, the, the reason the historical process used a lot of sodium sulfide in here. So if you're adding more sodium sulfide in here, that sulfur's got to come out here as a sulfate. So that's one of the bigger, benefits of the Twom process is because we don't add fresh sodium sulfide, it's only the sulfide that's liberated in the leach year by for every mole of arsenic that goes into solution, there's some moles, maybe half a mole of uh, sulfur that goes into solution. So the sulfate we're bleeding out of the circuit here is really only coming from the, the arsenic that's leaching. So that makes the process compared to the, the antimony processes where you're adding a lot of sodium sulfide, which means you then have a lot of sodium sulfate to get rid of at the back end. You can bring this back as, as you can make sodium sulfide out of it, you can do other things with it, but um, and that's still a challenge in, in some environments. Um, you know, what do you do with that if, if there's no market for that? It's not a big it's not a big stream, but it's still a stream that needs, that needs to be dealt with. So where to next? When you're commercialising a technology, it's very hard to go to a, a company and say, here's our IP, here's our technology, you know, do you want to use it? Um, it's certainly something we've learnt with, you know, the Janet and Cell, the Eisenhill, uh, in NYM and Australia days, with the Albion process the same. Until, until you can offer the client almost like an engineered solution or help them get to an engineered solution, it's very difficult to commercialise. So as part of the accelerated commercialisation grant, we basically worked with Downer Mineral Technologies to develop a good engineering package, some 3D drawings, and uh, operating capital costs for different scale plants. So you've got to be able to give, give your clients something they can touch and feel. Again, so this is a small 40,000 ton a year plant. This is what it would look like, reagent area, filtration coming in, filtration going out. Uh, leaching circuit, solid liquid separation, a small solution autoclave. Again, it's not a complex autoclave, it's not a brick line titanium autoclave that you see in a HPL circuit. It's just a solution autoclave. Um, evaporators and crystallizers. Um, give you a feel for what a 40,000 ton a year concentrate treatment plant looks like, it's probably about 65 by 25, 30 meters. Again, you've got to get clients to 
you know, cell division, which I've been the brain, you know, what it looks like. Back end on the vitrification. Uh, as I said, we're looking at lots of different ways of fixing the arsenic at the back end, but we've done some work with Dundee Sustainable Technologies in, in Canada. They've been developing a, a vitrification process for arsenic trioxide dust from smelters, and uh, they're actually building this demonstration scale plant is actually being built and commissioned in, in Namibia at the moment, the Sumed smelter. Basically, it's a bit like volcanic glass or you know, obsidian. It's basically chemically binding the, the, uh, the arsenic phases, whether it's arsenic trioxide or sodium arsenate. And then they're adding iron and some other things to make, make sure that it's not just chemically bound, but also encapsulated in the glass. Extremely stable and uh, you know, meets current PCLP and world to environmental standards and likely to meet standards you know, in five and 10 and 20 years time. That's the other reason we're sort of leaning more towards something like this from a back end point of view is ferric arsenate might meet the world requirements today, but it probably doesn't meet the world requirements in five or 10 or 15 years time. Um, operating costs, I'm going to go through the operating costs. Just in terms of, so when, when you're looking at one of these technologies, you, um, to implement a technology, you, you're trying to sort of say, well, what's the benefit for the, if I add this capital and this operating cost and I, I save these treatment charges and these penalties, what's the project look like? Just on the technology, a small plant won't be economic, a larger plant will be economic and will be able to pay off its capital and, and get a return for the investment. But this is the part which I'll then talk about in the next stage is that's only a very, very small part of the prize. Um, probably a bit like mobile phones. When I mean, the mobile phone came out, you know, it was probably designed to make phone calls. You know, in fact, I can't even make a phone call on my mobile phone phone. It's, it's to drop down from 4G to 2G to actually make a phone call. But the mobile phone then opened up all these other opportunities that businesses could use up and do other things. So, so the same with the long process, just solving you know, the arsenic penalty issue and the, and, the, and the value you're getting from that is not enough of a price for the risk you're taking. Where are the uh, costs? It's, it's obviously mainly in reagents and, uh, and, and capital. But where's the, where's the bigger prize? The bigger prize is in allowing mining companies to optimise their, their extraction of the ore body. And you'll see an example shortly. The bigger prize is projects that can't be developed because they can't blend their concentrates because there's so much arsenic that you need so much clean concentrate around the world that are, are, are stranded. Fixing, fixing the arsenic, fixing the arsenic in a really stable way compared to shipping it to China or India and then putting it in a in a electrostatic precipitated dust and then just stockpiling it in land, well, you know, landfill, which, which happens in a number of places in China and India, is not the way the industry should be going. Penalties will go up at some point. We've been saying that for a while, so maybe it won't, but you know, at some point, China and India will tighten up their um, you know, pollution and regulations. So what, we did some work, we did some work about a year ago with Little, Basically looking at their enterprise optimization uh, approach to, to optimizing mine sites. So in terms of in terms of looking at benefits, you know, when you do some change which has a cost as an NPV, maybe improvement or, or negative. There's other benefits that allow you then to, to look at how differently to open up the ore body and mine it differently. And then there's all, all, also the, obviously the, the intangible license to operate benefits. So we did we did a synthetic case. We looked at we looked at all these benefits and tried to quantify these in, in a in a synthetic case where we basically took a, a high arsenic a copper ore body um, called Marvin. Um, had some resemblance to Tampacken, but it wasn't Tampacken. <laughs> It, um, so it's a smaller ore body, it had arsenic distribution, top, bottom, different areas. Um, 
and we basically did, did three cases. We sort of looked at just mining and processing it as, as the sort of whittle optimization typically do without really thinking about the arsenic in concentrates and the penalty, you know, the optimizing that part of the equation. We then looked at one where we were optimizing the mine schedule to, to, to maintain a 0.5% arsenic production through the life of mine and, and maximizing the value. And then we plugged in a, an optimization with a small to long process plant treating 100,000 tons of concentrate. So what did we do? We added, as I said, we, we added a, a small concentrate to one process plant to treat 100,000 tons of high arsenic concentrate. We added extra capital in the concentrator to, to look at strategies in the mine where you might, you might change from a two-line operation to maybe a three-line operation and have two lines treating low arsenic ore and one line treating some higher arsenic ore. So doing a little bit of selective mining uh, to, to allow that arsenic be in a smaller concentrate. Now that could be done by, by an any guy chuckle separation approach as well. So where you're putting some capital in the concentrator to make a smaller, dirtier concentrator. We put in a cost for removing the arsenic in, in the Tuong. There were some constraints here on products. What did we end up? In case, in case one, there was only a very small amount of high high arsenic antibody oil that could be added into the schedule to not allow the product to be over 0.5% arsenic. In case three where we had the Tuong plant in, available for the, for the site to use, we basically increased from 3 million tonnes of this high arsenic oil to, to 40. So in, in case one, you basically had 37 million tonnes of high copper, high arsenic oil going into the stockpiles generating AMD, generating a lot of um, arsenic in solution and creating no value for the operation. In case three, we were bringing this high arsenic ore in and uh, some stockpile material. Over the life of the mine, significantly larger production base, significant uh, recovery of metal that would have otherwise been stockpiled and treated as waste. So what does the value proposition look like for the miner? So this is, yeah, this is where we've got to look at how we capture the value of the technology, not just for the, for the bit that the technology really does on its own, but what it's doing for the operation. So case one, it was an unoptimized project. Case two was optimizing it with little traditional optimization approaches and, and using all the stockpiling and blending capabilities. So a big improvement, but even from case two, to case three, where you now have removed that arsenic constraint in the mine, massive, massive improvement in MPP. Well, there's, a, there's some examples in, in, in the industry at the moment. You've got Wafu, uh, Wafi Gold, Newcrest and Harmony are developing in, PM, in uh, PNG. There's a high arsenic zone in their ore body, and they're now looking to, to basically move their whole block cave operation down another whatever 500 metres to access cleaner, lower grade arsenic ores. So the lead time for that project to drop their caving, their first starter cave 500 metres lower, uh, you know, there's a lot more development, a lot more lead time, massive negative impact on the project. So something like this technology can, can unlock those, uh, those blockages. As you can see, massive increase in uh, uh, mine life and uh, life mine revenues and, and margins. I think we've covered most of these. Um, so where, where to next to core? We basically, we've done up to uh, sort of full scale piloting. The arsenic fixation part of the process needs a little bit more work. Um, so we've gone out to the market to seek a, a collaborator to basically <coughs> take the project, the technology to the next stage. We're, talk, we're talking to miners that obviously have an interest in the technology because they're seeing a lot of high arsenic you know, copper gold ore bodies and a lot of high arsenic gold ore bodies. Um, we're talking to smelters that are struggling to, to source uh, clean concentrates to actually operate in the country they're operating in. And we've been talking to some of the traders that are doing the blending of these high arsenic and low arsenic concentrates uh, around the world. Where does the technology need to be? The next stage really needs to be a larger scale 
it won't be commercial, it will be um, a larger scale, basically fully integrated plant that's running, uh, that might be semi-commercial, and, uh, and we're looking for partners to basically take that through. We've had a process over the last three months to, um, with a data room to solicit a whole lot of uh, companies, and we're basically engaged with a number of companies now to bring that to fruition. So next steps is really secure funding for about another 18 months to build this um, two-stage process and then get the larger scale um, demonstration plant built somewhere in, in the world. So until you've got that first sort of operating plant, it's very difficult to sell the technology to, uh, to other, other companies. A few acknowledgements. Obviously, David was involved in and supported the initial work um, and, and their team at CORE. A lot of people been involved, um, had a lot of good support from Down Mental Technologies, uh, with along some of the optimization stuff we've been doing together. Uh, Dundee, we've been doing a lot of work collaboratively on, on different Arsenic products that we can pull out of the, out of the process and see how we can uh, optimize uh, the fixation stage for the vitrification. And obviously the federal government uh, over the last couple of years has funded some significant uh, work programs to help us commercialize the technology. So thank you everyone, thanks for listening. Any questions?